Let's give God some praise like he deserves. Give God some praise like you won the fight. Give God some praise like you've been set free tonight. Yes! You know why people get excited and they shout in these kinds of atmospheres? You don't want to know why it's, it's so loud in here? Well, there's, there's just something so exciting, so, so thrilling about someone who's been knocked down so many times. And it looks like they're down and out and they can't get up. And you see the ref in the ring in the boxing ring, he's counting one. And he's counting two, and it looks like they're not going to get up. He's counting three. It looks like he can't get up. He's counting four. It looks like it's all over for you. He's counting five. It looks like your marriage is all over. He's counting six. It looks like the doctor's report is going to send you into the grave. He's counting seven. He's counting eight. He's counting nine. But then Jesus comes in the room. And when it looks like it's all over, Jesus comes and lifts you up. That's why it's so loud in this place. So one more time, give Jesus a shout if you're thankful that he's risen you up, that he's given you life, and he's given you a new beginning. Woo! Don't we serve a good God, church? He's faithful. We're in the middle of Passion Week. This is the most holy of weeks of all the years. But everything we do all year, there's no more important moment on our calendar than the week we're in right now. I know to you, your birthday is the most important day of the year. I get it. Or maybe it's the day that you celebrate your anniversary. I know it's important. Ladies, I'm not saying it's not important. It's important. My wife's in the front row. It's important, my love. I love it. October 10th, 2020. I'll never forget it. All these days are important. All these days are significant, but there has never come a day with as much weight, significance to our eternal existence like the week that we're in right now. So what is Passion Week? As a church, what we're doing, we've, we've made this decision and commitment that we're going to celebrate passionately this Passion Week. We're going to attend passionately. What does that mean? We're going to come and join together and worship Jesus. We're going to give with passion. We're going to fast with passion. Some of us right now, we're fasting. We're not drinking anything except water with our normal meals. Some of us... You know, it's been difficult not say no to coffee. It's been hard, but we're doing these things to celebrate and to honor our risen king in this week. What's so significant about this week? Well, in this week, since the beginning of time, since before we all existed, God had an eternal calendar in heaven and he had this week and this, these days marked off on the calendar. And this was his mission that he would come, Jesus would come born as a man and he would enter this earth and he would walk among us and he would live this wonderful life and he would heal the sick and raise the dead and he would give himself as a sacrifice for us. This week, God knew about since before you were born, since the earth was created, he knew this week would come and we're standing right now in the middle of it. You may be thinking, what's so significant about a man who died 2,000 years ago? Well, here's what's so important about this moment, is that it just didn't happen for 2,000 years ago. It happened for you tonight. And Jesus right now is in this room. You may not be able to see him, but you could probably feel him. He's here, and he's knocking at your heart's door, and he's declaring this to you, that your old life, your old sin, your old addiction, I paid for that on the cross. And no longer do you have to suffer from the penalty or the price of your own sin, but I could take all that weight upon me. The penalty, 
the wrath of God, the sickness, the destruction, the disease. I could take all of that upon me so that you can now be free. Come on, give God some praise if you're thankful for what he has done in this moment in Passion Week. Man, this, I love this worship team so much. They got me all riled up. <laughs> Aren't they amazing? Let's give a hand for our awesome worship team. So tonight, we're going to talk about a very significant moment. It's called the Last Supper. We're going to define it. We're going to dissect it as much as we can. We're going to open it up. We're going to see how significant, how powerful this moment in time was. Jesus had one last supper with his followers, with his disciples. You guys ready to dive in? Pray with me. Bow your heads. Jesus, we pray tonight that you would speak directly to our hearts. We're not here to, to listen to some man's opinion, to some guy on a mic. God, we're here to listen to your voice. So, Father, I pray that you would speak right through me. and You would open our hearts to hear your voice tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And we all say... Amen and amen. You may be seated. Give me never a high five. Tell them I'm so excited to see you in church tonight. Woo. God is good. Tonight we're talking about the Last Supper. And this is a very significant moment in the history of time. We learned that during, in, 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 in all of Scripture, if you go from the book of Genesis all the way to Revelation, you'll find that God always points to one man, Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's God in the flesh. And we can see that God's aim, his goal since the very beginning, has always been to bring humanity back into relationship with himself. So what God does, because of our own sin, what we do, we end up separating ourselves from God. How many can agree with me that maybe you've messed up, you've sinned? How many, you sin quite a bit? Well, how many just sin in the drive in here? You sin, well, I'm just kidding. <laughs> We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. But it's always been God's plan since the beginning that Jesus would be given as a sacrifice for all of us so that we can, he can now bridge the gap between man and God. There is no other religion, there is no other faith, there is no other book, there is no other prophet that has given up his life for the sake of those who betrayed him. This is the, this is the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to die for all of us sinners. Even when we rejected him, he loved us. How many know that is good news? So what is this last supper we're talking about? We got this, you know, you can kind of see it behind me, this picture of the last supper. What is this all about? Well, just moments, hours even, before Jesus would be betrayed. It was the moment that was to come. He would be betrayed into the hands of those that would crucify him. He has one final meal with his disciples. He has this, this, this with his closest followers, and he gives them some instructions before he was betrayed. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. I'm gonna start from verse 26. It says, as they were eating... Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces. You can see I got a bread up here. He took some bread, he broke it. He blessed it. And it says, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine. And he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. This is what's so good about this story, is there's so much going on here. 
And this moment that took place on the calendar, I'm telling you, God had this all set up from the beginning. This happened during a festival or a season, a celebration called the Passover celebration. Say Passover. You probably have heard that in church before, if you've maybe come here and there. Maybe you've never heard that word before, Passover. Now, I don't want to turn this into a theological lecture, but I'm going to teach a little bit. And if you want to learn a little bit about what the Bible says and about what all this means, it's very important. So I encourage you, listen in, lean into it, take some notes. I'm going to share some terms maybe that may sound like they have no significance, but it's very powerful about what's taking place here. So again, say with me, say Passover. What was this Passover celebration that was happening? Well, Jesus and all the Jews at the time, it was the, the Passover celebration was the most sacred feast of the Jewish year. It was very, very important. The Jewish celebration, it was an annual celebration. They did it every year and they celebrated as a remembrance of what God did when he rescued his people from Egypt. Okay, so Passover, every year, it's like, you know, like we have in, in, in America, we got the 4th of July. The 4th of July is a day that some of you just thought it was a day we just blow up stuff. But it's actually more than that. The 4th of July is, is the day, July 4th, 1776, the day that the United States officially declared their independence. It was like, wow, we're free now. We're our own country. It was the birth of America. So there was importance behind it. And the Passover celebration was a lot like that. The Passover was celebrating this moment of remembering that God rescued his people out of the bondage of Egypt. You guys remember the story about Pharaoh. Pharaoh, he was a cruel uh, uh, slave master. He, would, he was using the, the God's people as slaves and, and Moses went up to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And he refused and he had a hard heart and he did not let the people go. So, so God issued judgment upon Pharaoh. And there was plague after plague. You guys remember the plagues, the frogs and then the, the sea of blood and, and all of these different plagues. If you watch Veggie Tales, you probably remember that. If you don't know what Veggie Tales is, you did not grow up in church. You grew up probably in the hood. It's okay. We're learning. We're learning. And all this took place. All this happened. And the last plague, the last plague that happened upon Egypt was it all, that all the firstborn males in the, in the homes, in the livestock, would all be killed and die. This was God's judgment upon Egypt. They had idols that they put before God. They had all these false idols, and they, this was God's judgment upon Egypt, and this was also God's judgment upon Pharaoh that he did not let God's people go. And then, so this happened. This was, this was the judgment. And God's people, they were instructed to sacrifice a lamb. You guys remember little Lamborghini from Sunday? What's Lamborghini? Well, one, one of the members of our church, they have a farm and they brought a little cute little lamb. We probably should have brought Lamborghini tonight too. You know how cute Lamborghini is? cute little lamb. I know this is sad, but they would sacrifice little Lamborghini. Some will say, oh, that's terrible. A sweet little innocent lamb. And God's instruction was for God's people, he said, to, to sacrifice a male lamb or a goat without a blemish, a perfect little lamb, and sprinkle the blood along the door frames in order for that home to be passed over. So this is why we have the name Passover. Because the, there would be death that would happen in every home. 
because of the judgment, there would, because of the plague, every firstborn male, every firstborn livestock in that home would die, except for the ones that had the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. They would be passed over. The wrath of God would pass over that home. Show me that picture really quick. This picture is an example of what it would look like. They would take the hyssop branch, they would, they, would, they would sprinkle it in the blood, and they would begin, just like in this moment, they would take the branch and they would wipe it on their doorposts, on the top and on the sides, on the pieces of wood here. And as they did that, that spirit of death, that, that moment would not touch their home. It says in Exodus 12, starting at verse 2, it says, From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb. Me personally, I would not pick Lamborghini because he's so cute, but each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. Skip ahead to verse seven. It says, they are to take the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frames of the houses where they eat the animal. Then God would pass through Egypt and strike his judgment. And then he would pass over. Someone say pass over. He would pass over the homes that were sprinkled with blood and would not touch their firstborn. Exodus 12, skip ahead to verse 12. It says, on that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and, and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, we're going somewhere. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will, pass over, I will pass over you. And this plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. God is saying very clear. When I see the blood upon you, upon your home, sprinkled upon your doorposts, the blood of the lamb, I will pass over you. All judgment will pass over you. All the wrath of God will pass over you. So this Passover, again, this is a celebration. So God commanded them, celebrate every year. You know, God commanded his people to party. Not the kind of party maybe that we used to do. God's like, hold up, that's not the kind of party I'm talking about. But God commanded his people to celebrate. I want you every year to celebrate the moment I passed over you because of the blood of the lamb. Celebrate, get rejoice, give thanks. Why? Because I want you to remember that I rescued you from bondage. I want you to remember that I rescued you from slavery. I want you to remember that I pulled you out of the bondage this is what Passover was for. So, fast forward. Now Jesus and his disciples, they're celebrating the Passover celebration. Years and years later. And in the middle of this celebration, this is not by chance, this is not by coincidence. God intended for Jesus to come and die in the middle of the Passover celebration. Why? Stay with me. The reason why God planned for Jesus to come and die during Passover was because Jesus is now the lamb that was slain for all of us. And now anybody that is washed in the blood of the lamb is saved and the wrath of God will now pass over that person. Jesus became the lamb that was slain, the perfect lamb of God, so that we can be saved and rescued 
from slavery and from bondage. It says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Now the image you saw of the blood on the doorposts, we could put that picture up. The image you saw of the blood on the doorposts, there was blood that was sprinkled horizontally. There was blood that was sprinkled vertically. And there was another moment, there was a time that God intended to do exactly that. He said, no longer do you have to provide a lamb for this. But God is saying, I will provide a lamb now. The loving father is saying, I will now provide for you a sacrifice and will sprinkle the blood horizontally and vertically on the cross. Jesus now became the sacrifice for you and me. Is this making sense? So let's fast forward. Jesus is now with his disciples during the Last Supper. And he did something that no one else did during Passover celebration. He instituted a new covenant. This was a new celebration. This was a new moment of festival of eating. This was the communion. And this new covenant he introduced when he said, this here is my body that's broken for you. And this here is my blood. No longer do you have to find cute little Lamborghini and, and break him and spill the blood and wash it over your doorpost. No longer do you have to provide something for the forgiveness of your sins. But Jesus is saying, now I'm introducing myself as the lamb that will be sacrificed so that you can be forgiven and set free. So there was two things in this, in this Last Supper moment, two things in this communion. First was the bread. The bread we know represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us. Jesus said that my body, and ver, um, uh, going back to Matthew 26, verse 26, he says, take this and eat for this is my body. And he broke it in pieces. This represents his body that would be broken for you and I. Did you know that scripture prophesied that this would happen? 700 years prior, it was written in the book of Isaiah that this would happen. Isaiah 53 verse 4 says, yes, it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the, lay, let, yet, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. He said, take this and eat. This is my body. It was broken for you. This hadn't happened yet, but Jesus was instituting a new covenant, a new celebration, a new moment. He was introducing the new lamb that will be slain for all of us. And then there was a cup. The cup represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled for us. It says in verse 27, Matthew 26, verse 27, he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. Jesus gives the cup and it represents the blood that will be shed on the cross. It's because of his blood that we, be, we can be forgiven of our sin. <clears throat> it's because of the blood that we can be washed. It's because of the blood that we can be made clean. It's because of the blood of Jesus that we can be declared right in God's sight. It's only because of the blood of Jesus that we do not inherit the wrath of God anymore. But the wrath of God passes over us as if we've never, ever, ever sinned, ever. 
It's because of the blood of Jesus that we can now stand boldly in the presence of God and declare his holiness and worship him with hands, holy hands lifted to heaven. It's because of the blood of Jesus that we can gather together an ex-sinner, an ex-convict, an ex-addict, an ex-adulterer, an ex-everything, an ex-drug addict, an ex-psycho, an ex-murderer, an ex-everything. And we could stand before the presence of God, saved, set free, delivered. I was blind, but now I could see. I was lost, but now I'm found because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It says in Ephesians 1, 7, because of the blood of Christ, we are bought and made free. We are made free from the punishment of sin. And because of his blood, our sins are forgiven. His loving favor to us is so rich. See, when you think back to the, the ways you've lived, the lifestyle you were in, the, the, the sin that you so willingly partaken in, the, the, the lifestyle that you once lived, when you think back to those things, you can't help but just know how much loving grace God has for you that he would still love you and rescue you and see you as valuable and say, son, daughter, I love you. I have a plan for you. Come, let me heal you. Let me offer my body and my blood so that I can give you forgiveness of your sins and a brand new start. See, every time we participate in communion, we remember, we proclaim again and again that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. We go back to the moments we can remember the way we used to live. And when we take communion, we remember that it was because of my sin that Jesus broke his body. It was because of my wrongdoing that Jesus spilled his blood because of what I have done, but because he's so loving and full of grace, he willingly gave himself as a lamb that will be sacrificed so that I can be forgiven and set free. If I can have the keys up here, please. When I take communion, I say these words. I'm saying, Jesus, I need you. When I take communion, I'm saying this from my heart. Jesus, without this, Without your blood, I'm doomed. I'm lost. I, I'm a wretch. There's no good in me. I have nothing good to give. And when I take communion, I remember. The same way God commanded his people to remember during the Passover celebration, he said, now I want you to remember me. I want you to remember what I have done. I died on the cross for you, son. I died on the cross for you, daughter, so that you can be forgiven and have a new start. Jesus is starting a new covenant with you and I tonight. And he's saying, do this in remembrance of me. What we're gonna do tonight, church, we're gonna take communion. And in this moment, during Passion Week, a time when Jesus was celebrating the Passover, the same time of year that Jesus sat down with his disciples and had one last supper and introduced the new covenant. We're going to do the same thing tonight. Right now in this moment, we got ushers all over the room. If you did not receive communion elements, just raise your hand. If you have the elements with you, let's prepare. But before we do this, before we take communion, I want us to examine our hearts. The Bible says to examine yourself before you do this. Why does God say examine yourself? We should find ourselves worthy in this moment. We should honor God when we do this. Why is that? Because when you think about what Jesus did, we can't help but take this with a humble and a grateful heart. In this moment, you may feel far from God. 
You may feel unworthy to take communion. Well, that's the good news about who Jesus is, that he's willing tonight to forgive you and to give you a new start. Bow your heads with me. We're not dismissing right now. We're just preparing to take communion. Examine your heart. Ask yourself, if I take this, am I taking this with the right heart? Am I in right standing with God? Am I honoring the Lord with my lifestyle? And if the answer is no to any one of those, then right now in this moment, you can repent. You can seek the forgiveness of God. You can be made right right now because of the blood of Jesus. So say this with me. Say, God, thank you. You gave your only son as the Passover lamb so that I can be forgiven. When I take this communion, I want to do so with a right heart. I want to honor you and remember what you did for me. Now lift the bread. Jesus said, this is my body which is given for you. He broke it in pieces. He gave thanks to God for it. Are you thankful for the body? Are you thankful that Jesus took nails in his hands? Are you thankful that Jesus took whips on his back so that we can be whole and healed? God, we're thankful that you would do this for us. We're thankful that Jesus, you offered yourself as a sacrificial lamb so that we can be forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, for your body. We remember what you did on the cross for me. In Jesus' name. Let's take and eat together. And then this is the cup. Jesus said, he took the cup of wine, excuse me, after supper, saying, this is, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. You know, when we do this, when he says in remembrance, we're saying we're remembering what Jesus has done for us. He rescued us. We were a slave to sin, and he set us free. We remember that there was a penalty of sin that was on our heads, and we were forgiven of that. Remember that you no longer belong to the world or to the enemy, but to God. We remember that once we were an orphan, abandoned, lost, and Jesus adopted us as his child. We remember that there was no hope for us, and Jesus became our hope. These are the things we remember when we drink of the cup. Jesus, we thank you for the cup. We thank you for your blood. Without it, I don't know where I'd be. We don't know where we would be. But because you sacrificed and spilled your blood on the cross, you willingly gave your life for all of us. You died so that we could live. You became poor so that we could become rich. You became our sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. You did this all for us. Did we deserve it, Lord? No. There's nothing we've done to say we could earn your blood being spilled on the cross. We weren't good enough. We didn't make the right decisions. We fall in time and time again. 
So God, what motivated you to do this? Lord, it was only because you loved us. You valued us. You purchased our freedom so that we can have a relationship again. This was your plan from the beginning. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that washes us and makes us white as snow. In Jesus' name, let's take and drink together. It's okay to celebrate. This is a celebration. You know, when I, just in, in reading scripture and going through what the Bible was saying, I felt like understanding this gave such a new meaning to John 3.16. We've pro you've probably heard John 3.16. It's the most quoted scripture in the Bible. I'm going to read it to you anyways. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How many are thankful? How many believers we have in here? How many, uh, how many are celebrating this moment that Jesus died on the cross for you and I? How many are thankful that a loving father gave his one and only son so that we would not perish? We would not be subject to the wrath of God. We would not burn in hell, but we can be saved and set free because of what Jesus has done. If you are thankful, I want you to stand to your feet and give God some praise tonight. Give him praise like this is a celebration of victory. Give him praise like we just got set free from slavery. Give him praise like we just got redeemed and got a second chance at life. I'm so thankful. Tonight, you may be in this room. You may not know Jesus personally, but he wants a relationship with you. Jesus will not force a relationship with you. He will always give you the choice to make. But he's given you so much, so much evidence, so much, so much, so many promises, so many things to motivate you to make the right choice. But the reality is you still have the option. The ball is in your court. You can decide today to surrender your life to Jesus, to give him your life, to symbolically paint over the doorframe of your heart the blood of Jesus so that you can be saved. You also have the option to reject God. The Bible says in John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. You have a decision tonight to make. Decide right now. Decide in this moment if you want to receive Jesus Christ or to reject him, it's your choice to make. The good news is that you don't have to leave here and make your life right to come to God. We all know that doesn't work. The good news is that you can surrender right here at this altar, your life to Jesus Christ, and he will take you just the way you are and give you a brand new life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna count to three. And if in this moment you're saying, I wanna give my life to Jesus, I wanna surrender to him, I wanna accept the body that was broken. I wanna accept the blood that was shed on the cross because I know I acknowledge I've sinned against God and I'm ready to turn away from my old lifestyle and to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, I'm gonna to count to three and I want you to publicly raise your hand among your brothers and sisters here and say, that's me, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I'm counting to three. You're raising your hand. One, two, 
three. Raise your hands all over this place. I see your hands. I see those hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Anybody else? Keep your hand up. Ten. Anybody else? Eleven. I see you. The lights are 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. There's hands. There's 29, 30, 31, 32. I see you guys back there. So many hands I can't see with all the lights. I see you guys. I'm proud of you. Can we do this before we leave? If you raise your hand, I want to invite the altar team up here. We have a team up here. We're going to pray for you. And we're going to celebrate you. Like, it, like this is the Passover celebration. If you raise your hand, I want you to come up to the front and I want you to make a public declaration up here at the front that you're giving your life to Jesus. Come on, church. Let's get excited. Let's clap. Let's, let's celebrate like this is their Passover celebration. Like God is rescuing them out of slavery, out of bondage. Come on, make your way up, make your way forward. If you made that decision, if you raise your hand tonight, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus, come to the front right now. This is your moment. Come on, as they're coming, we could sing, we could worship. still coming up. Let's still clap for them. They're still making their way forward. For those that came up, we're so proud of you. We are so, so proud of you. If you came up, you could just look at me for a quick second. We're going to help you in this walk. This is the beginning of your new life. God is rescuing you. And here's the beautiful thing about his love is that you may feel like you have nothing to offer God, all you have is depression. All you have is anxiety. All you have is fear. All you have is worry. Well, you know what's so good about God? He says, give me all of that. Give me your heart. Give me everything. And I'll give you love. I'll give you peace. I'll give you hope. I'll give you salvation. This is what God is giving you today. So what we're going to do, we're going to help you grow in your walk. We're going to help you learn how to take your next steps. And what we're going to do, we're going to get you signed up to get baptized. Someone say baptized. When you get baptized, it's, it's like you're going under the water. You're dying to your old life, and you're coming up a new creation. Let's get baptized. So we're going to sign you up to get baptized. We're going to help you. We're going to uh, show you a class called Starting Out the Way. The person in front of you, they're going to pray with you, and they're going to get you signed up. How many are so thankful for our new brothers and sisters up here? God is good. Let's close with a word of prayer. Church, don't forget, this Friday is Passion Friday, is Good Friday. We're going to have a passion experience. We're going to see firsthand like we're in the streets of Jerusalem. And then Sunday morning, 6 a.m. I know you're saying that's early. I've never woken up that early. Well, there's a first time for everything. We're going to come 6 a.m., sunrise service. We're going to gather and worship God together on the most holy day of the most holy week of the year. We're going to do it together. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, thank you that you went to the cross for me. I didn't deserve it, but you did it because you love me. I believe in you. I put my faith in you. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. I repent from my old way. And I give my life to you. From this moment forward, I'll never be the same again. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for setting me free, and giving me a new beginning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen.